but who do you say that I am? It's not an easy question to answer, but Jesus really wants to know because how you answer that question matters. Jesus had taken the disciples to the district of Caesarea Philippi, which was known as the birthplace and cultic center of Pan, Greek god of the wild. Half man, half goat, he was considered the god of shepherds and flocks, fields and mountains, rustic music and impromptu mischief. Herod the Great had built a temple there in 19 BC to honor Caesar, but right behind that temple was a cave that was believed to be the gateway to the underworld where Pan lived in darkness among the forces of chaos, destruction, and death. And it was in that place in the shadow of everything that opposed God and God's will for the world that Jesus asked the disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And the answer to that question was easy. They'd been traveling with Jesus for the last three years, watching him teach and heal and reach out with compassion to people that had been beat down and pushed aside. And they'd heard all the rumors. Maybe Jesus was John the Baptist. He was certainly a controversial preacher. Or maybe he was Elijah. Jesus was always saying the kingdom of God is at hand and the prophet Malachi had said that Elijah would return to usher in the great and terrible day of the Lord when God's kingdom would come on earth as it is in heaven. But he was also a lot like Jeremiah, who was always getting in trouble with the authorities and being rejected by the very people he was trying to save. Or maybe he was another prophet, a person sent by God to speak for God in the world. All very viable answers that showed the people's awareness of some aspect of Jesus's ministry. But every one of them failed to discern the depth and the fullness of Jesus' identity. So Jesus said, but who do you say that I am? And the answer to that question was not as easy. But Jesus really wanted to know because how his followers answered that question matters. Thomas Long says that every age has tempted to transform Jesus into its own image. Jesus has been described as a great teacher of wisdom, a social reformer, a champion of individual freedom and worth, a gentle nature lover, a mystic, a streetwise revolutionary, there are grains of truth in all these depictions, but in each case, he says, people have pounded a peg labeled Jesus into a hole drilled to fit their own religious preconceptions. It is tempting to simply make Jesus a mirror that reflects all that is good and just and right in the world. But God didn't send Jesus into the world to reflect the world. God sent Jesus into the world to save it with a power beyond anything we could ever imagine. You heard Van try to explain it by describing a spiritual dimension of love that we can sense and feel but are unable to see because Jesus is no longer physically present. But Jesus was right there standing with the disciples when he said, but who do you think, say that I am? And Simon Peter was able to say, you are the Messiah the son of the living God. And that answer shaped the rest of Simon Peter's life. Blessed are you, Simon, not because he was a perfect person, 
but because he was perfectly open to the power of God moving in the world through Jesus. To say that Jesus was the Messiah or the Christ was to claim that God had kept God's promise to deliver his people from the forces of darkness that they could see and feel and sense all around them. They weren't living in a pandemic, but they knew what it meant to be oppressed by a government that treated them like nothing more than a potential problem in an economic system where the rich kept getting richer and the poor kept getting poorer, surrounded by people who idolized political leaders, athletes, and inanimate, lifeless, spiritless statues of other lesser gods created by human hands. And they had been living with that kind of chaos, destruction, and death long enough to know that they were powerless to defeat it. But they believed that God would keep God's promise to send a Savior who would bring light and life and peace and prosperity to a people living in darkness. And because Simon was open to the power of God moving in the world among them, he was able to recognize Jesus as the one who was sent by God to save them so they could all live the way they were created and intended to live. But who do you say I am? It's not an easy question to answer. But Jesus really wants to know because how his followers answer that question matters. Simon can answer it with a confession of faith because he had personally experienced God's faithfulness through an intimate relationship with Jesus. He'd walked with him, talked with him, worked with him. He devoted his time, his energy, his resources to the ministry of Jesus because Jesus was saying and doing things with a power and authority that was changing the world around him in ways that he could never have imagined. And he wanted to be a part of it. So much so that he was willing to leave the only life he'd ever known to follow Jesus and learn a new way to live. And because of his faithfulness, Jesus said, you are Peter or Petras, which literally means rock. You are rock. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Which kind of makes Peter sound like a superhero, doesn't it? You are rock, strong, solid, capable of crushing the enemy. But we have to remember that rocks are also capable of sinking and causing other people to stumble, both of which Peter had already done. But Jesus said he was going to build his church on this solid, sinking, stumbling rock of a disciple, not because he was a perfect person, but because he was perfectly open to the power of God moving in the world through Jesus. And because of his faithfulness, Peter was given everything he needed to continue being a vital part of Jesus's ministry of light and life and peace in the world, even after Jesus was no longer present. Jesus said, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. In other words, Jesus was freely giving Peter full access to the kingdom of heaven so the church could not only know but do the will of God on earth with nothing less than the power and authority of the Messiah the son of the living God. But it wasn't going to be easy. One scholar said that handing Peter the keys of the kingdom was like giving his 16-year-old newly licensed driver the keys to his car. Could he handle such an awesome responsibility? Was he ready? 
Peter had learned from the master. But Jesus knew there were things that Peter could only learn by living into the example that he'd been given so he could experience the joy and the heartache of doing the will of God in the world for himself. Mistakes would be made. Crashes would come. But God would never abandon Peter or the church that was built on the foundation of his confession of faith. God always was, God always is, and God always will be working in the church to keep it faithful and through the church to give faith to the world. But it takes people like Peter who are open to the power of God moving in the world to change the world. So Jesus calls us in this time and place to take a good hard look at everything around us that is opposed to God and God's will for the world and then ask us the very same question he asked the disciples. But who do you say that I am? It's not an easy question to answer. But Jesus really wants to know because how we answer that question matters. Caroline Lewis says that who do you say that I am is really about who we are willing to be. Are we willing to be the hands and feet of the one who brings light into a world of darkness? Are we willing to face the forces of chaos, destruction, and death with the life-giving power of God's love, knowing that the gates of hell will not, cannot, and shall not prevail against it? Rick Morley wrote a blog a few years ago where he pointed out that gates are a defensive military move. Nobody ever won a battle by building a great gate. They're not meant to fight but to prevent, contain, limit, hold back. He said, gates are defensive in nature. So when Jesus talks about his church struggling with the forces of evil, Jesus just assumes that the church will be on the offensive. He assumes that hell will be counting on their gate in a defensive position. And when it does, that gate will not prevail. But who do you say that I am? Or more importantly, who are you willing to be? Because if Jesus really is the Messiah, the Son of the living God, sent by God into the world, not to condemn the world for its limitations, but to save the world by breaking down the gates of hell that prevent us all from living the way God created and intended us to live, then everything the church does in this time and place matters. The church was not created to be a nice, safe haven in a mean and dangerous world. It was created to see injustice, call it out, and act in ways to correct it, just like Jesus. So every time we feed the hungry, clothe the naked, visit the sick and those in prison, and speak out for those who have been silenced, forgive the people who have hurt us, and reach out with compassion to the people that have been beat down and pushed aside by a sinful society, we're opening that gate that Jesus has already unlocked a little bit wider so that everyone will know that they have been freed by the power of God's unimaginable love that is still working in the world today. But who do you say that I am? Or more importantly, who are you willing to be? To God be the glory, great things he has done through his son, our savior, Jesus Christ. 
and great things he will continue to do through his church when all God's people open their hearts to the unimaginable power of his steadfast mercy and love. Amen.